pass the gavel to, to Howard uh, to lead the, uh, the, the panel discussion as a moderator. Uh, and thank you, Dan. Uh, did, Brandy, did you receive the slide? I do, and I'm loading them right now. Thank, thank you very much. So I was asked to be a summarizer, but really it's not so much summarizer as it is stimulating some discussion. And I was given uh, one slide. Um, and so I think that uh, the quote from the, the uh, famed American philosopher Mary Violet Relling um, is, uh, is really important. That you know, can you implement if you don't know how it works? And part, part of this is that I'm not sure we're discovering in the right context. And by looking at pharmacogenomic implementation from the way it's been done traditionally, we're, we're really looking at, at endpoints that often aren't the, the exact ones needed for, uh, for, for implementation. And we're, we're not necessarily involving the right people in that effort. And so I think there's an opportunity in Emerge to really overcome some of this because the discovery will be happening in the context of, of routine practice not within the, the um, unusual situation of a clinical trial. Uh, and and uh, especially in the oncology area, uh, we know that the patients who are able to go on trials are, are the, the rare, unusual patients, not the, the normal patients. I think that the, the randomized trial versus the organically randomized uh, data uh, from the clinic uh, is, is certainly an important element. Emerge has an opportunity there. But I, I really worry that, uh, and, and, we, and we can get the necessary sample sizes, as, as Dan uh, alluded, Dan Roden alluded, but I'm not sure that we have the right methods for really optimizing data from the electronic uh, health record. And I, I don't mean the, the methods for extracting the data or deriving phenotypes, uh, but from a study design standpoint, yeah, this is a, a pretty nascent area and it needs some, some focus. Uh, last thing, there's not a lot of of, of uh, evidence that we can do iterative interventions uh, into the electronic health record. Now, Vanderbilt's done a little bit of that, uh, but there, there's still a lot to be learned about how do we take the eMERGE-like setting um, and, and turn it into an implementation science in its uh, setting, in its, in its fullness. And then lastly, the, the, something from, from Dan Mays is that you know, guidance for best evidence-based therapy selection is the sweet spot for pharmacogenomics. It, it's something that, that can be done uh, with, uh, with, implement, with these infrastructures such as we have for eMERGE. But there, there's still a lot of work to be done uh, to not only discover, but to really push it forward into, into practice. So I'll, I'll stop that time at this point and, and see, if, see if we can get some uh, discussion started. The, the floor is open for uh, questions or comments here, and, and I'll lead with, I guess, a provocative question because it seems to me the dichotomy between discovery and implementation makes it sound like implementation is just a done deal, that operational health care is something you don't change. But in fact, the other major theme afoot at, in the national agenda is learning health care systems and they continuously change, uh, and they continuously learn. So how, how do, uh, so I'll ask Mary first, um, wh how, what's the intersection of her set of assertions and the idea of learning healthcare systems? Well, I mean, a learning healthcare system, uh, I guess you could say that there's aspects of, that drive that learning that are based on implementation projects. Um, but I still think that those are largely coming from research, right? So we just had some examples of that with these system-based, quote, randomization. But that really is a research project to see whether outcomes are indeed better if genomic medicine is used versus not. If you know that outcomes are better, if you know that a patient has a completely inactivating variant in their TPMT status, you, it would be 100% unethical to give them the normal dose of that drug and to test yet again, 30 years after we know the answer, whether there's more or less toxicity or better or worse outcomes in patients who have their thiopurine dose based on TPMT or not. So that could be a part of a learning healthcare system if the healthcare system is practicing really bad medicine. And I acknowledge that there are many aspects of healthcare systems that are practicing 
horrible medicine, but that doesn't make it right for us to try to capitalize on that lousy health care in some kind of vulturistic way just to generate more data for something that's not ethical to study. Uh, Chris shoots me a plank. I, I, I don't disagree with you, Mary, but I, I think the, the question of where is this boundary between research and implementation, the whole elegance of a learning healthcare system is that, you know, the, you really merge quality improvement and research in a sense, because they're the same methodology, even though they're done by different people, uh, and, and apply the results not only to the literature, but to the practice. So, you know, we don't, we haven't discovered everything. I think we can safely agree upon that. Uh, and in the context of, I guess, expanding the boundaries of our discovery, it's a more systematic integration of research, in a sense, into practice so that we can harvest uh, the experience of routine clinical practice, which for the most part goes fallow uh, in, in today's uh, biomedical world. Uh, so I, I, I actually see it more positively. I see it positively. I just see it as clinical research, not implementation. This is just uh, part, of my, part of my reason for including the are the right people involved in the effort uh, question was, was around what, what Chris just raised, and that a lot of the folks involved in quality improvement uh, aren't involved in, in uh, eMERGE or aren't involved in a, a lot of these efforts. And certainly at my previous institution and my current institution, I've been able to to cause change to happen much faster by working with that group uh, than by uh, sticking with the group that's more comfortable with um, an a endless number of clinical trials. Yeah, and this is uh, Mark Williams, and I, I would um, also add uh, to the discussion, having worked in integrated healthcare delivery systems, and again, using uh, the methods of quality improvement coupled with research, I think there is a real sweet spot there. But I think perhaps the takeaway uh, for the questions that Howard has uh, uh, teed up is if we think about the next phase of eMERGE, would a component of that be um, what are the appropriate trial methodologies or would a proposal um, uh, uh, for an RFA uh, have to include something uh, that says, uh, you know, what is your pragmatic trial methodology to be able to study this, because that's where you know the the implementation research is really going. And as an example, I mean, PCORI is highly emphasizing pragmatic cl clinical trials, which I think Emerge is very well positioned to be able to leverage. So it, is that the question that we're really asking about inclusion here, which is different trial methodologies? So this is Julie Johnson. Um, I mean, as I listen to this conversation, it, I, I think um, the, the question was put forward as a dichotomy, really, um, discovery versus implementation. And, and in reality, there are three steps. There's, you know, the original discovery of the genetic association. Um, and, and unfortunately, most cases in pharmacogenetics and otherwise aren't at the stage that TPMT is, where I think we, we still do need evidence for whether um, the genetic association has clinical meaning, um, and so and so that's not discovery and that's not implementation. I agree, it's it's some sort of clinical research, and so I think the question is how do you do that best? And then and then there's the clinical implementation, and so you know it is. It, I, I think part of the problem is that the latter two things have been lumped in some ways in in quote implementation. You know, so is implementation the stuff that's truly ready, and then you're testing uptake and, you know, attitudes about uptake and that kind of thing. Um, and, and then we need to come up with some term for that middle, that middle space. So testing the relevance of implementation, um, testing, you know, or testing the, the value, the clinical value of utilizing genetic information to guide care decisions. Um, and so, you know, it, it does seem like eMERGE is, is really obviously positioned for the, the, so if we say there's three things, the first and the latter, for the middle, depending on the trial design, and I think like Mark said, if there's pragmatic designs, then, then perhaps eMERGE is really perfectly situated. And I mean, I, I 
would tend to agree that that might be the better approach, but if it's a more traditional clinical trial design, then I don't know that that makes sense. Um, so I would argue that the question is it may be posed quite right because I think there's really three phases and we're talking about the first and the last when we say implementation and discovery. And, and that middle piece, which is maybe where we need the most help, is, is kind of missing. Yeah, this is Urban from Mount Sinai. I think I, I agree entirely with what Judy said and uh, certainly reflecting on the conversation, I think a number of points were raised that uh, clearly uh, need to be considered very seriously. And the, the, one of the major points from Howard on his slide is that <clears throat> do we have the right people for implementation? And I would say within the current structure of eMERGE, probably we are uh, not, we don't have the right level of, of expertise for implementation because you know what's missing in eMERGE, the great people is that of the constituency of provider uh, and experts in, in clinical uh, care and workflow. So if implementation is something going forward, then I think there needs to be a clear expression that this uh, stakeholder, uh, or these stakeholders will need to be uh, brought into the fold. That is, you know, people who understand clinical workflows that are essentially clinicians. And currently, we don't have those at the table for true implementation. I also think, uh, in agreement with, with, with Mary, that uh, and, and truly that the, the, we are well positioned in this sweet spot and uh, in between and with some you know, intelligent approaches, what Mark pointed out, pragmatic clinical trial design and others, we have some unique opportunities. One was raised and was mentioned recently in conversations that we had with our external advisors. So this opportunity that we have is the recall by genotype and we should think about this, what kind of uh, uh, fantastic opportunity this is for us where we have you know phenotypes across the electronic health record we have genotypes for tens of thousands of individuals and if there are burning questions or uh, 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 scenarios for which evidence needs to be generated in a specific case to move something over the border from uh, research to generate the evidence that would allow us to formulate an implementation strategy I think that's what we can do with this kind of approach. And so perhaps that's one uh, way of thinking about that sweet spot. So this is Justin. I want to uh, re-emphasize what was said. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is from Paul Clayton, who said that you implement every system three times. You implement it once to find out if it can be built at all. You implement it the second time to figure out how you should build it. And then you actually build the one you use. Um, when we talk about implementation science, a lot of that focuses on the uptake of the intervention by the target party. Um, but in fact, in eMERGE 2, we're actually at that first step of implementation. You know, can you even build a genomic decision support system that will bolt onto an EHR? So most of the questions of implementation science are the ones we will address when we build the systems the second time, which is to figure out how we should build them and integrate them into the workflow. So I think we need to think about, as they were saying, implementation is multiple things. And a lot of what we're doing right now is just, can we make the technology jump through this hoop at all? And I think an appropriate target for eMERGE 3 is, OK, if we can make the technology jump, how should we make it jump to optimize the clinical practice? This is Zach. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Um, it's very unusual for me not to be able to uh, jump right in, so I'll do my best now. So um, Dan Roden um, made some comments which uh, triggered in my mind some, uh, I think, important scientific questions uh, for eMERGE 3. So Dan um, mentioned that some rare variants uh, were at a higher frequency in the um, African population. And then on the uh, chat part of uh, this meeting software, um, he also responded to everybody that there seems to be about 50,000 perhaps African Americans in the cohort. And I think that's important because uh, to say in a three-part question. A, 
does Dan think those rare variants that are more common in the African uh, in the Africans um, are actually the causal variants and therefore actually to cause a pharmacological change in uh, those uh, individuals if they were sub sub uh, subject to the same drugs. In the context of B, uh, recent um, very nice papers showing for a number of heart diseases such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, rare variants that were supposedly causal in, in, and first ascertained in European populations have uh, uh, prevalences of 30 percent in Africans where it's clearly not the case that uh, there's 30 percent HCM in that population, which leads me to the scientific agenda for Emerge 3 is I really think we can start um, addressing, and we should address, because very few others have, and we're in a unique pop uh, position to be able to do so because of the electronic health record system and health center derived populations to be able to start understanding the degree to which some of these variants are um, genuinely um, causal variants or are incidental findings that actually could result in overtreatment or mistreatment of uh, individuals in underrepresented minorities. And to that, I'll leave Dan Roden and others to respond. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll take the opportunity to answer that because he asked me specifically. So the, the answer to the, whether CYP2C9 star 6 is causal or not, I suspect it is because we know something about its function, and, uh, and it's a reduced function allele, and therefore it makes biological sense as well as uh, as well as statistical sense. Um, but I think that the more generic question of uh, variant of uncertain significance, especially in the rare variant space, is, is one that anyone who takes care of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or in my case, you know, cardiac channelopathies, struggles with every time you see a patient. Um, and I think that uh, we're going to have to come to an understanding that there are diseases that are caused by rare variants, that are diseases, there are phenotypes that are likely to be modulated by rare variants, and then there are rare variants that, whose role in pathophysiology has been dramatically overstated by initial studies. Um, and I, and I, I agree with Zach, if we're ever going to make headway on a variant that is one in a thousand, how, how are you going to figure out what it does to a phenotype? You can either do an in vitro evaluation of function, and sometimes even those are, are misleading, or you can ask the question, does it associate with uh, some kind of phenotype? And, and to do that, you have to have very large numbers, and uh, we're one of the places, Emerge is one of the places that can do this. Uh, I see that people are talking about Biobank UK, uh, about, about Kaiser, about the VA, and, and I think that those are large resources that with which Emerge ought to consider collaborating. Uh, it's easy to say that, and it's actually operationally hard to do. Each one of them has their own access models. Each one of them has their own uh, data sets that are, uh, that are bigger in some ways and smaller in other ways compared to eMERGE. Uh, I know a little bit about Biobank UK, and, and they are having trouble uh, getting the kind of detailed electronic health records that we are used to within eMERGE. So uh, they may have 500,000 samples, but they have that drawback. They have the great advantage that they have very, very detailed phenotypes uh, for some particular diseases. So I think each of them brings something to the table, and Emerge is as large as it is, ought to be a player in that space, and I think I've said enough. Yeah, and this is Dick Winchelbaum, and I, I couldn't agree with you more, which will shock you that I'm saying that. But, but as a matter of fact, what you said, and I think what Emerge has shown, has profound implications for clinical trial design. I think the Emerge program is beginning to tell us that the way we've been doing the studies with 2,000 patients in one arm, standard therapy, and 2,000 in the other arm, standard therapy plus another drug, may not be the way to go forward. Do you have any comments with regard to the implications of your own comments for clinical trial design? Uh, no. <laughs> I think I'll let other people talk. I don't want to uh, monopolize the airtime, but, but I, I, I think that uh, I will just say a generic comment that uh, implementation in trial design uh, has to happen um, uh, after we do discovery. 
or, or coincident with, and I made the point that, that you know, Dan Mason's made the point about a, a learning healthcare system, and that was sort of what I was trying to do on the last slide. I think that the implementation side and the discovery side go hand in hand. As one data set grows, the other data set by its nature uh, gets richer. So this is, uh, Mike, I'm just two quick comments um, about the VA's um, uh, um, Million Veteran Program, we do have, we're approaching about 50,000 African Americans, so I, I do agree, Dan, that there's, you know, plenty of reasons to um, figure out how best to collaborate, and, and uh, we are working behind the scenes on figuring out how to create data sets that, that can be accessed from outside um, and also de-identified to, to overcome some of our, our um, collaborative barriers. Um, but the second is that we've got a big initiative on um, implementing trials within the the system, and I, I really think that we, we do need to focus some attention on implementation of trials that are um, more broad in, in terms of their um, enrollment, but that use the, back, the EHR backbone rather than every time we do a trial creating a whole new electronic backbone um, to support the, the trial activity, and we've got a trial um, uh, in that point of care mode that's uh, under review um, next month that will be randomizing people at the time they pick up their, their drugs. It happens to be a hypertension trial, of course, allodone compared to hydrochlorothiazide, and we've got some regulatory issues to get around. But I, I think that, you know, emerge with its, um, it, its um, expertise in implementation could help play a big role in figuring out how to do very large trials at a, at a very low cost, utilizing the electronic health record or, um, and, and making trials, you know, go from $100 million trials to you know, five or ten million dollar child. Uh, this is John Harley in Cincinnati. Um, maybe one of the themes of uh, Emerge Three would be to assess benefit. We would have we have the uh, we have the electronic medical record to go to, and we'd have this enormous database. And so, if the issue in clinical application is benefits, then we would be in a really powerful position to actually reach some kind of uh, resolution or make progress about what judgments to make about benefits. Yes, yeah, so I think because, I mean, we're, we've been excited about the Human Pharmacosis Project, and I think that can be expanded to a variety of things, and that's a really interesting question. And I would lengthen that uh, to penetrance and which variants are and are not pathogenic. And I think a huge amount of the work in genomic medicine now is understanding what variants are pathogenic and which are not. And we have a lot of data that we could um, put to that question and really understand that in, in Emerge. It'd be really exciting. Uh, Howard, I want to really echo that point because w both, both uh, penetrance and heritability can be derived from this data set with current technologies and can really add some rich context to almost every phenotype that is just totally missing right now. I mean, we're chasing things. Uh, that really we, we shouldn't and vice versa. And, and uh, that would be a, a huge uh, service to the community in addition to all the cool methods and, and findings that would come from it. Yeah, so I agree. This is I think this is the sweet spot. There was just a, a comment earlier that if uh, there's a rare gene frequency of, uh, of, of 10 percent or less, we really need to enroll a, a, a thousand people with that genotype in there. We are not going to be able to do that for the number of potential uh, genetic variants. We have to at some point go ahead with implementation and then use different study designs to study the truly rare genotypes. We cannot randomize every one of them and think that we can get prospective studies of everyone. Certainly some will need to, but, but by and large, we can't, we can't hold back implementation until we have every SNP sorted out. Yeah, so, I mean, the idea is not to do a giant trial of every variant. Mm -hmm. The idea is that you, you need very few people with the same variant to say, well, if they all have breast cancer by, you know, 89, then it's a, probably a pathogenic variant. Yeah. And if none of them do, you know, if three yeah. people don't have breast cancer by 89, then probably it's, you know, not a, one of the pathogenic people. Because we're talking about genes that we know what the gene does. We want to know what certain variants in that gene do. The most important genes to us are the ones that we know cause disease. We want to know for each variant in that gene, does it cause disease or not? And actually, you don't have to throw a lot of people at each single variant to get that information. 
pleiotropy, I think there can be a lot of different phenotypes associated with the Sure, sure. No, I think that's a, a separate interesting question, yeah. but, I, but I think this idea for individual rareish variants, that you don't need a ton of right. data. Okay, so we're uh, just a little behind schedule, but it's been a very rich discussion, and I think it is it, it, exactly squarely in the uh, in the sight of what eMERGE should be doing and uh, taking advantage of opportunities that only this network has. So we'll um, should, should we just ask if there are any burning things? That okay, is anything is there. anything burning out there? <laughs> okay. Well, so I think it's fair to Neil Rich. You know, is either, either is not on the phone or hasn't had a chance to say anything, but he's been sort of active in the chat part of the box. And for those of you who haven't looked at it, you should. You should. He makes the point that there will be um, between Kaiser VA MVP and UK Biobank, let alone uh, emerge, there will be you know 800,000 or a million GWA subjects um, soon. And so, is there a role for further GWAS in this space? I will say that I don't think UK Biobank has GWAS data yet. They're going to have the Biobank chip, and that's going to be late 2015. But be that as it may, these resources are getting very, very large. And so, is Neil on the phone? Yeah. Can you hear me? I was muted before. Yes, we can hear you. Can hear you. Yeah. So, um, as some of you know, you know. At Kaiser, we had a grand opportunity award. We did GWAS. On, we have about 104,000 individuals GWAS, a multi-ethnic cohort. It's um, an adult cohort. And um, of course, we have very extensive electronic health records connected to all these people. It's longitudinal over 20 plus years. Um, Mike Gaziano is on the phone. He can talk about what the, um, the VA Million Veteran Program is doing. But of course, they have extensive electronic health, uh, health record data also. And the UK Biobank, I think they've already genotyped over 100,000 individuals. They are going to be genotyping 500,000 total over the next, I think, about two years. Currently, they don't link, they cannot link to electronic health data in the British healthcare system, but there are certain things they can link to. They're also doing a lot of their own phenotyping. They are doing um, imaging on 100,000 individuals. They are doing lab lab tests on everybody, and I and I think they have extensive plans for doing more phenotyping. So <clears throat> I guess my point just being that in terms of the balance between, which was the topic here, the balance between discovery versus implementation, it seems to me going forward, if I had to characterize what I would see as the big strength in terms of eMERGE is that you have a lot of different health delivery systems linked to EHRs, you know, in this network, and the question is how you know, you can address, which others cannot, how this is going to be rolled out in different settings, how genomic medicine is going to be rolled out in these different settings, because then the size of the system really doesn't matter. It's, uh, it's really the variation across the systems that matters. So I, actually, this is sort of the way the discussion has been going anyway. A lot of this latter discussion has been about implementation, which seemed, seemed, to me seemed to be appropriate. Okay, good. Excellent. So what, we're a little uh, behind, but again, uh, an excellent discussion. And what we'll do is uh, attempt to uh, do a 10-minute break, uh, even though that's never been reported in the history of science. And so please please leave your, uh, your desktops open and your phones muted. Don't go offline so that you have to log back in. And we will plan to... Um, uh, begin again uh, the presentations right well we'll just do it right at uh, 30 minutes past the hour whatever the hour might be in your time zone <laughs> so we'll, we'll talk to you then